Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Hi. Hi, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine, how are you? Thank you so much for participating. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, the pleasure is ours. Who else is here? Let me just... Um... Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm about to also do a visual check in just a second. Thank you. No problem. I want to make sure that I pronounce the name of our moderator well. Can someone uh, tell me, pronounce her first name? I don't think she's here Maybe. yet. Mavis, our moderator. Say it again, Mavis? Mave. Mave, okay, Mave. Yep. Gotcha. <laughs> How are you doing, Najad? I'm good. I also know that um, Lonise um, is, she's going to be teaching her class shortly if she hasn't started already. So she might be on mute for most of this. Okay. Well, I see her connected. Thank you, Lonise. <laughs> I will acknowledge uh, both of your leadership at the beginning in my brief remarks. Let me just... Andrew is also supporting us behind the scenes. He's He's been sick, he's recovering, but he's gonna um, promptly at six, right? Andrew, you will let folks in. Yes. <laughs> Maeve, right? Maeve McDermott. Yeah, yep, you've got it. Maeve McDermott. Yep, Maeve perfect. McDermott. Yeah, I'm very sensitive about the importance of pronouncing names correctly, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we do have our speakers and moderator. Uh, we're still missing Maeve. Okay. Well, we can we cannot start without her. So. Yeah, I hope um she should be joining us shortly. She is at COP twenty seven. Oh, yeah. So there's spotty Wi Fi. Um, but if push comes to shove, I could always try to step in. Wonderful. I was already thinking about our backup. <laughs> And you have the questions and everything in the run of shows, so. Yes, it's all been shared to us. Fantastic. Well, let's hope she can make it because the fact that she actually is participating in COP27 makes it also quite timely for the focus of the discussion. She's joining now. Wonderful. Hi, Kian. Hello. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? I'm good. Also recovering. I'm not there anymore, but recovering from CUP. So I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, wow. if the, internet. Um, the internet was famously horrible and charmel shake. Um, but yeah. Glad she's able to make it. <laughs> I'm I'm there right now, and I'm having some troubles with the internet at this moment. So, yeah, yeah we we were being told. So, oh, we can hear you, great, man. We can hear you, and that's what matters, you know. I mean, if you can have the the cameras, much the better. But if not, we can hear you. 
Oh, thank you so much. I'm trying to turn it on, but I, it's not quite working. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. We have our speakers here, visible, and uh, you, you can be heard so very well. Yes, so excited to hear from you both. Um, I just want to make sure I'm saying names right. So <laughs> Ali Rogers, I know you, we're great friends, <laughs> know each other from law school, um, and then Paula Boland, and then Kidan Araya. Yep, almost. Um, it's Kidan Araya. Okay, Kidan Araya. Great, thank you so much yeah. for that. And I ask about your name pronunciation, Maeve McDermott. Do I get it yes. right? Yep. That's perfect. Thank you so right. much. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, okay. So we are one minute to to six, and Andrew will be opening the gate <laughs> very yeah, soon. Maeve, I, I just saw your message like a minute ago. Room's been open for 10 minutes. What was the issue you were having? Oh. Uh, I think I'm having some internet issues. I'm in Egypt right now for the cup, so sorry. It must be uh, on my end. All right, great. I want to make sure that nothing major was going on, but thanks for letting us know. Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry, it may have taken a, uh, taken a while to send through to you too, but that's uh, it's okay. working now. It's perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. Sure. Well, Maybe thank you for joining us. It's so late um, where you are. So I know. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. It's a. It'll be kind of a perfect end to the cup experience. So. <laughs> Absolutely. And you both got the um, uh, run of show that was sent around. I think everyone got it, right? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. I don't know if I got it, but let me, I might be slow on my end, but it's okay if it, but maybe it wasn't coming to us, which is totally okay. Oh, that's the, um, that's the Google Doc I shared with you, Ali. So it should be. Oh, great. Okay. Um, I'll open it right now. Okay, otherwise I can send it over, but um, it'll just be the same questions that were in there. Thank you so much. Well, we hope that more folks will join us because we, I was told earlier today that we had uh, over 60 RSVPs and we also sent a reminder to those who registered. So I know there's a lot going on, <laughs> lots of events, but yeah, it's we will be time. recording this and and sharing it later with your permission. Thank you so much. It's fine with me, Paula. Thank you. So should we wait another minute or two before I kick us off? Uh, we got 24 people in the waiting room or about two Oh minutes. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and-, and... So, um, Paula, give it a good minute before you start talking though, just to let everyone in, okay? Yep, we'll do. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, please remind everyone that this is being recording, recorded, chat included. Okay, let's get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's program on careers in climate change policy, sponsored by our Young Professionals Program, aptly led by Lenise Williams and Najad Nikabu. 
My name is Paula Bolen, and I am the president of the UN Association of the National Capital Area, one of the largest and most active chapters of the UN Association of the USA, which mission is to educate about the vital work of the UN and to mobilize support for a strong US-UN partnership. We serve over 1,200 members through a variety of educational programs and advocacy activities in the DMV area. If not a member already, please consider joining our movement and get actively involved in our chapter. You can visit our website at unanca.org to learn more about our programs, our committees, including the Young Professionals sponsoring tonight's program, as well as other uh, programmatic areas such as sustainable development. And join us for on December the 9th as we commemorate Human Rights Day with our annual awards ceremony back on Capitol Hill. Young people are responding to the planet's rapidly changing climate by committing their lives to finding solutions. Surveys are showing young people are not just incorporating new climate conscious behaviors into their day-to-day -day lives, but they're in, in it for the long haul. College administrators are saying, are seeing surging numbers of students that are pursuing environmental related degrees and careers. The United States Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that employment opportunities for environmental scientists and related specialists will grow 8% over the next 10 years, a rate much faster than growth in other industries. And a variety of industries um, are incorporating environmental issues into their work, giving young professionals flexibility to pursue a variety of career paths. It is now my pleasure to pass uh, the floor to our moderator this evening, Maeve McDermott, who is an environmental attorney and climate policy researcher. She's proud also to serve as co-advocacy officer for our uh, Young Professionals Program on the board. Maeve currently works as a coordinator for the Climate Law and Governance Initiative and as a legal researcher for Williamson, Williamson Law and Policy. She also conducts climate policy research for the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. Thank you everyone for participating and Maeve, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Paula, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, and good, new, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you at this event on careers in climate policy. I apologize that my camera is off. I'm joining this call, call from Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, where I've been for the past week at the 27th Conference of the Parties for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and the internet is a little bit shaky here. Recently, the executive secretary for the UNFCCC has said that we are nowhere near being on track to keeping global temperature increase under 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're already seeing the disastrous effects that the climate catastrophe is beginning to have on the world, whether that's the um, increasingly frequent and more intense hurricanes in Florida or the recent monster monsoon in Pakistan that's left thousands dead and millions homeless. Now, more than ever, we need hardworking climate policy professionals to advance climate action, whether that be in mitigation, adaptation, resilience, or loss and damage. Uh, across the board. So here tonight with us, we have two very special speakers uh, to share a little bit about their experience as uh, climate policy professionals and their road on this journey and to share advice with us on how you might pursue um, a profession in climate policy. So we have Allison Rogers with us. She's a climate policy advisor for the Aspen Tech Policy Hub at the Aspen Institute. Ali is a climate solutions advocate and sustainability professional who's committed to using the power of the law to combat the, the climate crisis. Um, and then we have Kidan Ar Araya, and she is a climate communication strategist with nearly a decade of experience working across Africa and the United States. She advises international organizations on how to strategically respond to and effectively communicate climate policy and a just energy transition. 
She's currently serving as a Women Leaders in Energy and Climate Fellow at the Atlantic Council and leads on climate communications and content, uh, content at the World Benchmarking Alliance. So thank you to both of our speakers for being here with us tonight. We're so excited to have you. Um, if you could just each start off, I'll start with Kidan first. If you could just give us a brief overview of the work that you've done in climate policy um, and your career to, um, path to getting there, I suppose. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, that's such a big question. Um, I feel like I <laughs> we could be here all night, but I'll try to um, make my response succinct um, and thank you everyone for um, making it. Uh, so for me, I guess I started um, very much in, I guess, grassroots experiences um, in communities. That's kind of what drove me to um, want to focus on climate policy in my career. Um, so when I went to college, uh, I knew I wanted to do um, international relations. Uh, I knew I wanted to study the environment. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and then I had an experience where I studied abroad in Cameroon, actually. Um, and this was many, many years ago before I would say climate was really on the agenda. Um, and being um, actually like visiting the Congo Basin rainforest, doing work there um, and seeing how the change in climate, um, how it was getting warmer there um, near the equator for communities and how they were already dealing with um, food shortages, hunger as a result of that. Um, that experience kind of stuck with me. Um, for these for all of these years um, kind of inspired me to um, commit to climate policy and I act actually worked in um, a variety of different fields um, before then um, or before I settled on climate because I think maybe many of you are thinking now like can you really have a career in climate um, so I had experience working in um, global health um, public health um, different kind of, I guess, domestic policy until I was realized like, okay, I really want to actually focus my efforts on um, international climate policy. Um, and that's when I started to work um, in DC. Um, I worked at a first at a campaigning organization um, that advocated for um, environmental protections um, and against environmental destruction in Africa. Um, and I worked there for many years. And then um, also worked uh, as a fellow um, studying climate finance, which is why I was able to get really deep into kind of the policy and finance, financial system, how our global financial system contributes to or doesn't contribute to um, a climate safe future for us. Um, and now uh, realizing kind of, which I can talk about later, uh, following where the joy is, where my strengths are, which I love communication. I love talking to people. Um, I'm now applying my climate policy um, into advise, advising different organizations on how they can effectively communicate um, the work that they're doing on just energy transition and climate policy. Um, so that's a very short um, introduction to kind of how I um, landed where I am. And I look forward to um, continuing the conversation tonight. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. We know you have a wealth of experience and we look forward to hearing more about your uh, professional and academic journey to where you are now. Um, Ali, we'll move to you. Can you please give us a, um, an overview of your career journey and what led you to work on climate related issues? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Maeve, uh, for the introduction and for moderating for us tonight. And um, Paula and Kidan, thank you as well. And thanks to everyone for taking the time to join us. It's so great to see everyone here. Uh, in terms of my path, I started um, back in college. Uh, I was very involved with what was called then the Harvard Resource Efficiency Program, which started when I was an undergraduate. Uh, and that was looking at how do we change the way that this very old uh, institution that's very historic and has lots of decades slash centuries of tradition, um, how do we help it change uh, in light of the climate uh, crisis that we are facing? So um, between 2002 to 2006, I uh, worked with other students at the undergraduate and graduate level, and then faculty and staff and administrators from across the university uh, for uh, how to look at how do we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with Harvard, uh, and then how do we run a full comprehensive sustainability program? 
program, you know, in terms of the type of food that Harvard was buying and um, what type of transportation vehicles it was using and, and the whole gamut in terms of a comprehensive sustainability program. Uh, that, for me, having the chance to work with such a um, cutting edge team that, in my opinion at the time, uh, the higher education sector was far and ahead leading other sectors in our nation. Uh, I was really grateful for that chance um, right out of college, but also just really seeing that we needed to take what was being done in the, you know, quote unquote, ivory tower institutions of our nation and making sure that business and other uh, sectoral uh, organizations were also doing the work, that it wasn't just academia that was showing that we needed to walk the talk on climate change solutions. Uh, so I was lucky enough after um, you know, working with the Harvard Green Campus Initiative, now known as the Harvard Office for Sustainability, I was lucky enough to be um, given the chance to go down to Washington, D.C., which is not somewhere that I was planning on moving, but uh, at the time, uh, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, when she had first become Speaker of the House in 2007, had uh, announced that she was going to make sure that the Capitol was also walking the talk, uh, and she was launching what was called the Green the Capitol Initiative. Uh, and so I just want to say, um, you know, given today's news of Speaker Pelosi announcing that she's not running uh, for seeking, I should say, uh, to be in a leadership position, um, but she will continue to uh, seek the people's vote for her current um, uh, position, I just want to say it was incredible to work for a leader who, uh, you know, really um, felt this in her heart that we needed to make sure that inst the important institutions in our nation are showing that they're doing the hard work because it is hard work to try to figure out you know, how do you make sure you are reducing your greenhouse gas emissions and you're doing everything within your operations uh, that you can be to address climate solutions. Thank you very much. Leading by example. Exactly. Thank you, Paula. Uh, and so that was an incredible opportunity. I was down in D.C. for about four and a half years uh, working with that program. Uh, and then uh, when the House flipped in terms of the minority and majority party switching, uh, which party was in the majority and which was in the minority, uh, that program luckily was saved in many ways by our partners in what's called the Architect of the Capitol, which is a 2,000 person organization, which is responsible for all of the physical operations of the Capitol, as well as the Supreme Court, Library of Congress, Botanic Garden, and, and other areas. Areas. Uh, it's an incredible organization and incredible people who are there, and they are still doing the hard work of sustainability initiatives uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, and there are partner organizations working in the district offices across our nation, too. Uh, so with that, I returned to my home state of Rhode Island, worked in state government for five years on a whole gamut of policy related issues, uh, a lot of sustainability and energy, but a lot of other areas, technology and diversity work, procurement, personnel modernization, all of the things that you think about in state government policy. Uh, from there, I decided it was time for a change and went to law school as a mid-career move where I was lucky enough to meet Maeve, our wonderful moderator. Uh, and that move was really out of the thought of, I wanted to better understand from a legal perspective, um, how do we make sure that our energy systems, we are operating them in ways that are most helpful for what we need to be doing within the climate uh, solutions work that we are doing? Uh, and how do we make sure that we are both um, passing laws that are going to be the most helpful for climate reduction, uh, excuse me, greenhouse gas emissions reductions efforts? And then also, how can we make sure that we are enforcing those laws to be meeting the goals? goals that we need to be meeting. Uh, so there's a very quick background. Right now I'm working with the Aspen Tech Policy Hub and we just wrapped up our first inaugural class of climate fellows, 15 incredible fellows who have uh, over the past several months developed policy proposals for uh, different organizations, both government and corporations uh, on how to implement climate solutions. And so that is an incredible organization. Happy to talk more about it. Uh, and I'm also working with Second Nature, which is an organization post focus on higher education institutions and working with them on their climate solutions. Uh, and I've been helping them research uh, cross-sectoral opportunities. So sectoral opportunities between higher ed and all of our other sectors at the sub-national level uh, in terms of what opportunities exist between higher education as a sector and other sectors to help us meet the aggressive uh, climate goals that we need to meet as, as a society. Uh, so that's a quick background of uh, my career.
And Maeve, I, I, I know that- We Maeve, lost our moderator. I, I know she was having Wi-Fi issues. Yeah. Well, um, I guess um, we can maybe wait 30 more seconds, but if Maeve isn't there, I can always hop in. Um, and for introduction, again, thank you all for coming. Um, I am one of the co-chairs for the YP program. Um, happy to step in and moderate here as um, Maeve is figuring out um, the Wi-Fi situation at COP27. So again, thank you guys so much for just like coming and for really just sharing so much on, on what you guys have been doing on the climate change space. Um, and so we would love to kind of just start with um, your career path and career paths that can really speak to um, the people who or our audience today rather. Um, and so the first thing is, um, what educational track would you recommend for someone to actually get a job within um, climate policy specifically, given that this is, of course, our career series event? And I guess, yeah, Ali, I, I see that you unmuted. Definitely take that on. Okay, great. Yes, uh, my recommendation is to focus in an area that gives you joy and Kiran to go to something you briefly mentioned, something that gives you joy and really where you feel you are thriving. And I know, uh, you know, in our younger years, sometimes it's hard to really be able to um, pick out and it may take some time with figuring out where that is. Uh, but I say that because uh, the climate work that we need to do in, is across the board. So we need every type of different type of specialty as well as generalists as well. So my opinion is that there is not one you know, specific career uh, path or specific academic background I studied religion as an undergraduate. Uh, I did try to have it focused on the connection between environmental work and uh, different uh, religions and, and communities of faith. Um, but I really think that it's where are you feeling that you have that sort of flow and you feel you're thriving. That is where we need you. Uh, that being said, obviously, there are different types of programs, public policy programs, you know, law degrees are super helpful. Um, but we need people who are doctors who are focused on the climate crisis and making sure that their patients are being prepared and, you know, are asking the right questions of, you know, in the face of extreme weather events? Do they have the right type of support and resources that they need? We need public health experts. We need engineers. We need renewable energy uh, developers and business leaders. So again, back to my earlier point, I would say whatever sort of makes you um, happy and is an area that is of interest, we need climate advocates and climate solutions uh, leaders in all different areas. I think that's an amazing response. I mean, climate change is affecting every area of our lives, whether it be um, when it comes to potential health issues that it might spark up, whether it be agriculture, even thinking of things like regenerative agriculture. So we need hands everywhere um, and the impact that that would have on farmers, right? So um, obviously there's a, there's a need for, for various actors. Um, but Keaton, I would love to hear more of your insight on this. Yeah, I agree. I think I had mentioned before, like going where the joy is. Um, yeah, I think like just finding what you like to do, um, what you feel like you thrive at um, and seeing where it can be um, of service. And I guess the climate movement um, and the climate policy field um, I will say like, yeah, for example, I think I spoke a little bit about it, but for me, um, I had thought for many years, I wanted to specifically focus on policy analysis, um, be a policy analyst or a campaigner. Um, and something that I did a lot when I was a campaigner was public speaking, um, because, you know, as many of you know, not everyone is on board with um, a climate agenda or an environment agenda and we need people who can effectively speak about um, climate priorities in a way that is understandable in order for people to um, see that okay we understand what 
you know, this movement is about or this agenda is about, um, how can it impact our lives? Um, so that's kind of how I got into communications is because I thought I was going to kind of be behind the scenes policy advocacy, and I kept getting invited to speak publicly um, about different um, environmental and climate issues um, and talking to um, leaders in climate philanthropy um, that I've worked with before who um, kind of were talking to me that, you know, we have so many brilliant like policy leaders, campaigners, researchers um, that are in this field, and it's kind of like we have so many ideas out there, but how are they actually trickling down to people? Um, how are they trickling down to um, decision makers? Um, I actually, yeah, about last year, I can't believe time is going by, but um, I had the honor of testifying in front of Congress um, about the impacts of environmental crime. And I honestly believe I was um, invited there because they wanted someone to speak plainly about it. Because I think um, in the climate field or environmental field, um, we have so much jargon, like even COP27, like not everyone even knows what COP27 means. Um, and we oftentimes forget that even decision makers don't, you know, they're not climate experts, many of them. So we need to under be able to communicate plainly and simply and effectively um, why it matters that decision makers should be prioritizing the climate, things like that. Um, so that's kind of how I got into um, this field of climate communications. Um, so even something like that, where, um, you know, right now it's a very, it's a niche, right? But I'm seeing more and more jobs opening up, for example, specifically in climate communications, because it's not enough to have someone that just is good at communications. They need someone who um, has an expertise in communicating and understanding climate, for example. So I think for anyone out there who, you know, you might be interested in a certain topic, uh, I think similar to what Allison says, I'm confident that you would be able to find um, your place in the climate, um, a climate career field. And I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with him, but there's, um, I guess, a climate intellectual um, in the U.S. His name is Bill McKibben. Um, but he just had, uh, I think, an article out or interview out a few days ago where he said, he wants young people to be electricians because we're all talking about this clean energy future and how we're transitioning to electrical vehicles and we want to have this net zero um, transition but do we even have enough electricians to support that right so that is going to be an extremely important job um, in this clean energy transition for example so even we think about like trades for example that are very very important if we're going to make this clean energy transition happen so i think you know, I think the, uh, I guess the opportunities are really open um, for you, like I said, to stick to your passion and, um, you know, see how that can contribute to the climate movement. Even, uh, I think we're talking about generalists, but even, um, for example, so many philanthropy dollars are going into climate and environment work now. And I've seen a rise of just projects needing like grant managers, right? <laughs> um, people who can effectively project manage um, funding that's coming in from this kind of windfall of climate um, project dollars. So um, yes, find what you're, you're excited about. And I, I think you'll be able to find your place here. Thank you so much. Those were both beautiful answers. I'm so sorry. Um, that my Wi-Fi cut out, but Najad saved the day. We have such a wonderful team here at UNA NCA YP Board. Um, if I could turn back to you, Kidan, I would love to know more about how you would define success um, in the career field of climate policy um, and what skills, hard or soft skills, do you think are essential for success in climate policy? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think everyone has to define success for themselves. I don't know if I could kind of outline what success um, means for everyone on this call. Uh, I think for me, being successful in the climate field, it kind of goes back to like what we were saying. You know, it's tough work, I'll be honest. You know, anytime people are doing work that, you know, requires organizing or, you know, you're dealing with different um, political situations and um, trying to improve the lives of people, for example, it can be tough, right? Um, so I think it's kind of back to what we were saying. It really is important. I think success looks like, you know, even on days where it's tough, you're still enjoying it. You still find your purpose 
um, or your work meaningful and purposeful. Um, and you, you can see and feel like you're making an impact, whether that's, you know, on a community level, um, uh, organizational level, uh, federal level, you know, whatever level that you choose to work on. Um, and I think like what we were just saying before, I think a key skill, even if you're not in communications is being an effective communicator, uh, cause that continues to be uh, a really re reoccurring theme. Uh, you know, we talk about climate policy and I think everyone here is interested in it, but like I said, there are a lot of people out there who um, are against um, political action uh, on climate um, policy at this point or on climate change. So how can you effectively communicate uh, what you're doing, how you're contributing to, uh, I guess, the climate movement, how you want to, how you see yourself in the um, in this space, I think is really crit critical and also just collaboration, because I think that's something that we actually don't see enough of, although I think it's starting. Um, and I'm someone that I've been in different circles of people who are involved in like climate security and climate finance and climate policy. And a lot of us don't really talk, to be honest, like we're kind of in our own uh, niches in climate. And that's just not uh, sustainable if we're going to really accomplish the systemic change that we want to make um, on a global level, federal level, state level. And so I think um, something that will lead to success is being a success um, is being a successful collaborator, someone who can bring people together, someone who's open to having conversations um, and kind of, yeah, back to that, um, what would make you successful, I think, being open to different people. I think even just kind of going to this call where you're listening to people talking about what makes them successful in this field. Um, I think it's just important to know um, kind of, yeah, the landscape and that's gonna help you figure out how you wanna contribute and what would success mean to you. Thank you so much. Um, Ali, I'm gonna turn the question over to you to see if you have anything else to um, add. I know Kidan had a, a wonderful answer. So just wondering if you have anything else to add to what success in climate, uh, the fields of climate change um, policy looks like to you and what skills, hard and soft skills uh, you think are essential for, for working in this field. Yes, I agree. Kidan had a fabulous answer. I think collaboration and a, and a collaborative approach to your profession is 100% what is needed for success in the climate policy and climate solutions field, for sure. Uh, in terms of additional skills, hard and soft, I think, you know, for all of us working in climate policy, you have to have that driving sense of curiosity to continue to want to keep learning about all the new things, partially because it is such an expansive type of portfolio. Uh, you know, it's, as Kidan said, it's, you know, related to electricians, it's related to transportation, it's health, it's policy, it's law, and, you know, within any one particular individual's career, it's so hard hard to try to become an expert on, you can't become an expert on all of those. So I really think it's best to try to, again, go to what is the core piece that is so, um, that it gives you your joy and your passion, but then keeping that partnered with this continuous curiosity to try to learn about all the different pieces. Uh, and then, you know, that can be supplemented with uh, additional training. So for example, you know, if you're more interested in the financial end and, you know, looking at what uh, the Securities Exchange Commission is doing in terms of this new rule of, um, you know, requiring companies to disclose their climate related risk and whether something's material from a climate change perspective, you know, there are different items that you can be doing like, uh, the SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and getting that, you know, um, uh, that credential. Or, uh, you know, you could go to uh, ACO, uh, the Association for Climate Change Officers, and getting that accreditation to be an accredited climate change professional. Um, there's different opportunities, and they're changing, and uh, and that's part of why I think the most important um, piece to this recipe of a successful career is just having that driving sense of curiosity to be keeping up with all of the things. Uh, and back to Kidan's point, also being able to translate those more technical things to policymakers and to the general public, because so much of the work in climate change policy is very technical. And we do have all these acronyms and all of, you know, so it's very important to be able to 
translate it into a layperson's term uh, so that we can get the general public and policymakers on board with the solutions that we're trying to implement. Thank you so much. I loved both of your approaches to that answer. Um, you've both mentioned various um, jobs in climate change, working in climate change, the profession of climate change, climate policy. Um, you know, we've touched from electricians, the need for electricians in the, the climate change field, uh, climate conscious electricians. We've touched on communications. We've touched on climate finance. Um, so many things that you've already touched on. So just wondering what trends you see developing over the next few years regarding careers in climate policy. Um, particularly, what does the job look, market look like for jobs in climate policy and what future do you see um, for the job market in this career? Are there other jobs that you see taking off in uh, particularly climate policy? Um, do you see anything that wasn't there before that is perhaps emerging now as the situation worsens um, and becomes more urgent? Um, Ali, I'm going to start with you for that question. True thing. Great question, Maeve. Uh, I think the job market is going to continue to explode in the climate policy, and which is really exciting for all of us that are working on these issues. Uh, and just excites me to think about where everyone who is attending tonight is going to be going in terms of um, different positions. So uh, I, I mentioned that we have 15 climate cohort fellows with the Aspen Tech Policy Hub. Uh, and uh, I have been trying to support those of them who are, you know, in a bit of a transition and looking to how to get get into climate policy roles. So uh, since this summer, I've been trying to keep an eye on many different job boards and institutions that are posting different jobs. And my take is that there's so many more opportunities now than there were three years ago, a decade ago, uh, which is really exciting. And I think especially with uh, these uh, two major pieces of legislation, uh, the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act passing, that it's going to mean there are going to be even more jobs coming down the pipeline. Uh, and, and it's what we've been hearing from our leaders in federal government, uh, that they're expecting even, even more jobs. Uh, and so my recommendation would be is to just really keep an eye on all these different sectors. Universities are hiring a ton. Corporations are hiring a ton. Uh, like I've said, I've been monitoring all these different sort of job boards that are out there, and there isn't one particular one, but uh, there's so many corporations that are hiring for, you know, chief sustainability officer positions or ESG related. You know, they're all call them slightly something slightly differently. Uh, there are city governments, county governments, state level governments uh, that are hiring, again, chief sustainability officers or chief climate policy officers uh, within the federal government. Uh, so many of our federal agencies are looking for new talent to come in to help advise on these issues. The one takeaway that I have been seeing is that some of these job descriptions for these really exciting roles are asking for uh, a background in a number of years that frankly may not be out there in the general pool. Uh, and so my piece of advice for this question it would be um, really work on building your narrative of your own story because, and don't let the job that says, oh, you need 10 years of such and such. A lot of people are not going to have 10 years of such and such because 10 years ago, that really wasn't even something that a lot of people were working on. Um, so my recommendation would be build your narrative in a way that you're able to show, you know, how you have been working on these in different capacities and don't let those requirements hold you back because there may be other applicants, there may not be applicants who are meeting that. So go um, aim for the stars and apply for all of these big, incredible jobs that are that are now opening up. Thank you so much, Ellie. I love those words of encouragement for us, um, especially as we consider applying to these jobs just to be bold and to really put ourselves forward in this field because it is um, there's so many different aspects of it that are emerging now that we can really be at the forefront of. So it's an exciting time to to be in climate policy. Um, Kidana, I'm going to turn the question over to you of just what trends you see developing over the next few years regarding careers in climate policy um, and just general insights into the job market um, of climate policy, what you see as the future um, for this job market. Yeah, great question. I think um, Ali did a really good job of 
explaining um, kind of the general scope. Uh, I also agree. I think this is only going to be a growing field. So I, I don't know if there's enough people right now for, I think, a lot of the jobs that are um, going to come to fruition. So I think it's a good time to jump in. Um, I mentioned it, but like I said, I'm seeing um, a lot more climate communications jobs. Um, and yeah, I was recently talking to um, a philanthropic organization recently who was like, we need someone who has a background in climate policy who can um, have a leading role in communications at an organization. Um, so I'm seeing more of that and I'm seeing more just roles, quite literally say climate communications strategist or climate communications lead. Um, it's like I said, everyone, we have so many amazing ideas out there and policy ideas on climate, and we still have a lot of people to convince um, on this agenda. So I think you'll see more and more communications rules open up um, in this field. Um, I think we touched on it a little bit, but talking about finance, um, there are a lot of uh, actions happening in the financial world that relate to climate. Um, maybe you've been following COP27, but, you know, the pressures from activists to transition away from fossil fuels, um, to divest, uh, financial institutions to divest from fossil fuels, oil and gas, for example, um, different financial um, institutions requiring that the companies that do business with them have certain climate standards and targets that they abide to. So I think um, I've been saying that already, but you're going to see increasing amount of jobs, um, specifically in climate finance, that can um, effectively measure, you know, companies, where's the money going? Are they in alignment with um, global climate goals or are they um, not in alignment, for example. So I think you'll start seeing more of that as well as, um, I think we talked about it, ESG, but yeah, people who can do the research and um, actually measure how companies are, um, how companies and governments, public sector, how everyone is contributing or not contributing um, to um, a low carbon um, future. Um, so I think that's um, something that you'll see. And I think additionally, I've been hearing a lot of talk, um, even when I was at COP27, uh, especially with the Inflation Reduction Act passing um, in the U.S., that there will be a lot of jobs that are coming um, up opening, especially, um, I guess, in 2023, which is right around the corner, um, because, you know, the IRA passed this year. Um, and now, you know, with the new year, new budget, um, people are going to be really looking to um, have people to support the implementation of that, because a record amount of dollars are going into uh, community organizations that are working on climate into um, certain agencies that are working on climate energy. And so um, it's just like, I won't repeat what Ali said, but it's just only growing. So um, I think it's just a very um, advantageous time to to be in this field. And um, I mean, I'll also say, I mean, we've seen some tough news in recent weeks on the tech industry, but the tech industry is also very much hiring um, climate and energy people, um, kind of what we were saying, companies need to, um, climate tech is also, you know, part of the solution. And so I've seen more and more climate tech, um, different startups happening. A lot of um, climate tech companies are receiving um, quite literally billions of dollars in investment recently. You know, people are looking for what is that um, you know, they're not the only solution, but can they complement some of these policy solutions? So I think if you kind of have that entrepreneurial mindset, um, that's also a space to follow that as hiring as they uh, receive more and more investment dollars every day. Thank you so much. We still have a few minutes left in the moderated discussion, but we have such amazing questions coming into the chat um, that I think we should turn it over early to the Q&A session. So I'd love to start with a, que a question sent by Regina Petark, um, which is what strategies do you recommend for those who are transitioning from other fields like law to climate policy, ESG or business sustainability policy, but we don't have experience in it? Um, and because she's mentioned um, uh, a variety of fields that you could be coming from, I'd love for both of you to answer the question with your different experiences coming into climate policy, but I'm going to start off with Ali first. Thanks so much, Maven. Uh, thanks for the questions that are coming on the, on the chat. Um, I My reaction is, um, again, to say with that sort of 
be curious with whatever, take whatever opportunities you can. Um, so, you know, for us, we have the Aspen Tech Policy Hub. We have this 10-week fellowship. I definitely encourage all of you to keep an eye on the Aspen Tech Policy Hub uh, for the future. It's an incredible 10-week curriculum. Um, for our fellowship, we take people who do not have a background in policy or have a very little background in policy. Uh, we're looking for people who are, for this cohort that we've just wrapped up, climate tech experts. The past cohorts have been tech, pure tech, uh, but hopefully there will be future climate tech cohorts in the future. Um, so people who have a deep level of knowledge, whether that's a you know soil scientist or water engineer or whatever other background, and give them this 10-week curriculum to really help them think through how do you try to create policy change? Um, how do you help institutions make that change that needs to happen? Uh, and, you know, it's the thought that we don't think everyone needs to go to do a two year public policy degree that, um, but, you know, a little bit of training may be helpful. Um, there are other programs that the Aspen Tech Policy Hub offers besides the 10 week full time program as well. Um, so by no means are, am I saying that, you know, we're the only option, but um, opportunities like that, that sort of may help you do the deep dive, help you get connections, uh, you know, put you in front of, for us, we have all these different speakers who come in, you know, 100 different panelists and leaders that uh, we expose our fellows to. So programs like that, I think are fantastic, especially if you're, you know, looking for a slight career change, um, you know, surround yourselves with people who are going to open up their networks um, for you and, and, and give you those opportunities. And then second, I really just think it's about branding and narrative and story, uh, you know, to be able to show how you have incorporated different things throughout your career so far, uh, and to be then building the narrative as to why you are the right candidate to walk into that climate policy role, that ESG role, that business sustainability policy role. And all of this, keep in mind, so many of these organizations, it's so new. Um, and so, um, you know, don't let that hold you back if you don't have X amount of years like it does have on whatever job description, really. It's so new in so many of these organizations that um, your interest and your passion for it is, is going to help you um, hopefully get that job and, and make that career transition. But I, I will try to think about other, other opportunities as well, besides the ones I've been sharing in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, Kidana, I'm going to pass Regina's question over to you as well um, for what strategies you would recommend for those that are transitioning from other fields um, into climate policy who don't have experience in it, um, but really do want to engage in the field. Yeah, I think that's an amazing question. I mean, I think for the sake of time, I won't repeat um, what's already been said. So Ali offered some great advice. Um, but yeah, I think I'll just double down on like those transferable skills. I think I mentioned to you all, I had experience um, working on climate and environmental issues when I um, was in college and I was in grad school, but I took a bit of a break from that. Um, so I had to also kind of jump back in. And I think focusing on those transferable skills um, really helped me. So for example, um, I think I mentioned it that um, one of my first like 100% focus on um, climate environmental issues was a campaigning job. Um, and for that job, there was a lot of French speaking partners. Um, and that's one um, thing that actually made my application stand out apparently um, was that I spoke French. So nothing to do with climate or anything like that. But um, a lot of the partners that this project needed to talk about um, environment and climate issues were um, in French speaking countries. So that kind of helped me stand out, for example. And I also think just kind of going back to like any experiences that you've had, like how can you apply it to what you've seen um, and kind of focusing like we talked about on the why are you doing this, for example. Um, so even like um, now that it's been many years ago, for example, that I studied abroad in Cameroon, but sometimes that still comes up um, when I talk to employers or when I talk to people about why, like tonight, of why I'm in this. So, um, you know, maybe you studied abroad or you traveled somewhere um, where you, you know, you saw the impacts of climate change, like just connecting kind of to back to that storytelling and branding, just connecting the why you're here. Like maybe I don't have, you know, if you don't have climate job experience saying like, maybe I don't have that yet, but I'm passionate about this. This is kind of the skills that I have to bring in um, that is helpful for this job. Like, for example, I've seen people who have been in research who are very skilled at data analysis, which is 
very important for a lot of climate, especially climate finance jobs, ESG, where they don't have any um, climate job experience at that point, but because they're strong and um, analyst, they're able to get in. So kind of just focusing on the skills that you have and the why you're so passionate. I think like what we talked about, a lot of employers, um, you know, it's it's a tough fight. So a lot of employers, I think, are very happy to hire people who are just passionate and are committed to this. Um, and, you know, if you have transferable skills, I think a lot of employers are very flexible flexible actually and um and being able to hire you as long as you highlight you know the contributions that you you can make and of course as you apply for different roles you know tailoring that um so not just maybe talking about why you want to work in climate or you're passionate about climate but you know if this organ if an organization that you're applying for is you know focusing on climate finance for example like what about that field really attracts you like really getting your story down in the why I think um, is really important when you're you're transferring um, or shifting different industries because people always want to know like why now you know um, and even if you don't have anything personal in your life like study experiences or whatever um, you know if you're really inspired by what's happening now in this kind of political moment with climate that's something that you you know you may feel like you could bring up as well um, and why you're transitioning backed by, you know, the skills that you already have. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We've heard um, some incredible um, and very practical strategies from both of the speakers. I'll just add, we're starting to see many emerging online certification courses um, in different areas of climate related work. So I do recommend I think there'll be some that are put into the chat, but uh, please do just uh, do Google searches for any sort of certification courses that might be helpful as you look for um, jobs and want to add these skills to your CVs, to your resumes. Um, we're starting to see online open courses, open access courses uh, for climate related fields. So check those out as well. Um, and then we have a question from Jessica Jones, who's asked um, her question is, how can we find trustworthy quality employers or organizations who do climate change work if we aren't currently part of the professional network? Are there lists of employers or organizations or specific keywords to look for um, or even employment guides that are available if they're just becoming familiar with the players in the field? Um, so um, Ali and Kidan, do you have any recommendations for different listservs or job databases that people interested in entering this field might be able to look for different job opportunities within climate policy in this realm. Um, Kidan, would you mind starting? Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know if I have like a workbook or um, like a guide specifically that I can offer, but um, I mean, I think you shouldn't let that bother you. I think I was not in any political or um, professional associations when I started doing this. So of course, professional associations are big strengths and network um, and a network, you know, is always very helpful, but that's not really required, I think, to break in. Um, for me, I would say find if you have an organization now that just even one that you really admire um, or that you've seen um, as kind of a reputable organization that's doing uh, climate work. Uh, well um I would just suggest kind of going um looking into their research and like what who are they working with like who are their collaborators for example um like even for example like if you um I'll give one for example when I was in high school I actually volunteered for Oxfam um America and I I find them to be a very reputable organization and they're doing work on climate so like for example if I find them to be reputable um, going to their website, seeing who they're working with, um, what kind of projects that they're working on. I think that actually leads you to a lot of organizations um, that are working on this. And um, I think a lot of it is just kind of through, um, you know, of course, there's the big organizations out there. And I think, um, I mean, of course, keywords, there's always going to be like finding what you're interested in, like looking in climate finance on Twitter or LinkedIn and finding who's talking about that. I think honestly, right now, if you have a Twitter, this is probably one of the best times to find organizations that you really like through like the hashtag Cup, Cup 27, because every, nearly every climate organization right now is talking about Cup 27. So just going through that hashtag, seeing like, what are organizations talking about? Um, and I think always like, you know, 
cold calls are never easy, but if you find an organization that you, um, you know, would be interested in learning more about, I think, um, you know, doing targeted emails um, or reaching out on LinkedIn or something to people, I think, um, especially people who are younger, I think are more receptive to that type of thing. Um, so that's also another great way to find out, like, maybe you've seen an organization that you like and you're interested in talking to someone or reaching out to someone who works there, um, you know, and seeing what their experience is working there is always good. And of course, if you don't have that personal connection, there's always, you know, things like Glassdoor, things like that, that can, um, you know, show you a little bit about what people's experiences are working there. But um, I'm someone, like I said, I had literally zero um, professional memberships when I started this. So I just don't think you should, that should, um, deter you. And I think, um, like I said, research, research on social media and Google, um, about kind of what, what really catches your eye, um, is really important. And I think, yeah, honestly, this week before cup ends tomorrow, um, is really the perfect time to be looking to see who's in the space and, um, kind of what organizations you're most attracted to. Thank you so much. Ali, I'm gonna turn it over very briefly to you, but I'd love if you could also um, provide some final words of advice um, that you would have for anyone that is deciding to pursue a career in climate policy. Absolutely. Um, in terms of the, the question about, you know, um, and the way I'm interpreting the question, making sure that the organizations that you're looking at are legitimate in terms of their um, commitment to climate change, if I'm interpreting the question correctly. Um, for me, it is making sure um, that organization, you're seeing that it's they're actually going to try to walk the talk, that they're not just greenwashing and hiring one position. Um, so any due diligence you can be doing, either you know from an online search to be looking at news articles or press releases, or looking at how many other roles are they hiring. Uh, you know, I, I would not want to, depending on the organization, of course. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to suggest to someone to go into some huge corporation and then you find out you're the only person than there, then it's a question of, are they really truly committed? Are they going to be giving you the resources that you need and a team around you to be also working on other climate and sustainability efforts? Obviously, that depends on what size organization are we talking about. Um, and, you know, hopefully that would also become apparent during the interviewing process as well to be really feeling out, are they an organization that's truly committed to making these changes and giving the support for these versus an organization that's just, you know, checking the box or something. Um, I do have a listserv and I'm happy to share it. Excuse me, not a listserv. I have been tracking sort of different jobs. Um, I have stopped recently, but if it's helpful, I'm happy to share it personally. I'm not trying to share, share it widely, but with anyone here tonight, I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, it can You can skim through it. It's mostly from the summertime, um, but you can skim through and see what types of different organizations have been out there and who are hiring. Uh, one organization, I have no affiliation with them, but the Rocky Mountain an institute I have heard is hiring a ton of people. I think they're doubling in size. They've gotten a ton of funding. Um, they do excellent work on climate and energy. Uh, second, you could also look at a website called America is All In, uh, which is a, the, the nation's largest coalition of uh, different organizations working on climate change efforts. So anyone that you see associated with the America is All In coalition, uh, they're all fabulous organizations that are really committed uh, to climate change solutions as well. If you are more interested in higher education, uh, sustainability work, uh, Second Nature is going to be having an upcoming um, summit in February, and that would be an incredible place to network and meet different people working on climate change in higher ed. I will also drop that link. Uh, it's the Higher Education Climate Leadership Summit. We welcome all of you to join us there. Um, and then on the Aspen Tech Policy Hub front, we are also, if you're in DC, which I think many of you are, we're hosting an event on December 5th, where we will be having our climate cohort fellows present on their policy proposals at the Aspen Institute uh, DC headquarters. You are all welcome to join. I will also send um, a link in the chat too. So um, feel free to stay in touch within the climate movement. I think it's so important that we work together, that we build partnerships and friendships uh, because the work is so humongous that we need each other and we need to be supporting and elevating and cheering each other on. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending your Thursday evening or wherever you are in the world, like Maeve, um, your Thursday 
slash Friday morning. Um, and so my biggest piece of advice is um, build your network and build your community um, around you and consider those of us who are speaking tonight as part of your community. Uh, we need you in this fight and we need to be um, getting you to the positions of power to be making the changes we need. So uh, we're here to support you and elevate you and cheer you on. And that's my advice. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, Kidan, would you mind just giving us a one minute, uh, very quick, uh, do you have any final advice for someone that has decided to pursue a career in climate policy? Yeah, I mean, I think those were really amazing words um, from Ali. I would, I would say don't rush. And I think give yourself time to explore. Like I said, this is a rapidly growing field. I don't think it's going anywhere, um, anywhere quickly, a good thing in terms of that it's going to stay around, right? I don't think it's going away, I should say. So I think you should give yourself time to explore like what and where you think you can make an impact. Um, I, for myself, for example, um, I think looking out, I think especially if you're in DC, there's so many professional opportunities, um, different organizations host fellowships. I know we talked about, um, for example, I was a climate security fellow um, at the Council for Strategic Risk. Um, just wrapping that up this year. Um, so giving yourself time, like, okay, I'm interested in climate security. Like, how can I, how can I learn more about that? And like we said, meet other people who are working in that field, growing friendships, growing um, a professional network um, to see like, is that something, a field that you're interested in? Is that what you really want to do? Um, and like I mentioned, I'm currently um, a fellow at the Atlantic Council um, on women leaders in energy and climate. And so that's a space where it's um, a professional network just designed to like bring women that are in this space together, um, build our capacity to be leaders, um, be in um, be in close network with each other. So I think looking out for those opportunities and there's so many um, out there um, to really see and explore like, you know, where you wanna be in this space. Do I wanna focus on clean energy? Do I wanna focus on climate policy or finance? Um, I think those professional opportunities are out there. Um, and like I said, I don't think you need to rush or put pressure on yourself to be like, I need to get into a career in climate policy today. Like really take your time to see like wh what you're passionate about and where you can make the most impact. Um, at an organization that we said is reputable that, um, you know, is a leader in this space that um, will also teach you things. So um, don't rush. And like I said, really find and take the time to figure out what you want to do. And I think the opportunities out there and, um, this space is and this movement is here to stay. Um, so I'm really excited as, as we kind of talked about where everyone here ends up and um, would love to stay connected and offer support. Thank you so much to both of our speakers for providing such insightful um, comments throughout this whole session. I'm going to turn it over very quickly. I know we're running a little bit over, but Renee Dapa from the American Bar Association and from the United Nations Association um, Advocacy Committee is just gonna provide us with some uh, brief closing remarks on this incredible session. So Renee, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Maeve. So everyone who is attending, please join me in thanking our speakers for tonight. Allison Rogers at Aspen Tech Policy Hub, Kadan Araya at the World Benchmarking Alliance and a Climate Fellow at the Atlantic Council for graciously volunteering their time and their really insightful and pragmatic advice on how to position yourself for a dynamic career in climate action. And that valuable list that you just provided of curated job opportunities. As they describe, it's an expanding area across all the major sectors, and there's new opportunities and careers arising. Thank you to our moderator who's joining us all the way from the Global Climate Conference in Egypt, Maeve McDermott, who is our advocacy officer of our Young Professionals Committee. And professionally, she's a co-coordinator of the Climate Law and Governance Initiative. And thanks to UNA NCA President Paula Boland for her welcome remarks and daily leadership of our organization. And I also wanna thank all of you. I wanna thank you for attending and your thoughtful questions. The fact that you're attending this career series today already indicates that you're on the path to a rewarding career in climate action. And let's not end the discussion here. 
Climate action is one of UNANCA's top priorities for this year ahead. Come join us and just as Ali was saying, build your community. For those of you who are not already UNANCA members, I strongly encourage you to join today and become active. If you're under the age of 25, act today on the current offer to join for free. If you're a first time member over the age of 25, your first year is currently $25, which is a bargain rate for the benefits you gain, particularly if you become an active member. And by that, I mean get involved. We have multiple committees. We have the Young Professionals. We have Sustainable Development, SDG 13 on Climate Action. We have Peace and Security, Human Rights, African Affairs, Gender Equality, DC for CEDAW. We have Advocacy, Membership, and my committee, which is the International Law Committee, that I co-chair with Leila Hanafi and with Katie Vera as co-chairing our Human Rights Committee. So UNA NCA relies largely on volunteer-led activities and globally-minded and amazing people like you. Getting involved, you'll be exposed to thought leadership and behind-the-scenes insights of multilateral diplomacy and international development. And you'll have opportunities to participate in and contribute to workshops, roundtables, publications, and opportunities for networking, mentorships, and volunteering. We have programs like the Global Classrooms, and we have new innovative projects like Global Goals at Home. So come join us for the professional career growth and growing your professional networks. And then stay for the friendships, which are very long lasting. So to become a member, visit unanca.org. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to any of the leaders of the staff listed on the website or the YP board members or me. And join us as Paul uh, was mentioning earlier on December 9th for our Human Rights Award at the US Capitol Visitor Center. And there's more information about that on the website in the chat. Thank you for joining us tonight and we will see you at our next committee meeting and on December 9th. Again, thank you to the speakers. That was incredible, the amount of information you provided. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. Fantastic program. Stay in touch. Bye.